Amen. Happy Sunday to you. And uh, we're going to dive right in because we got a lot of material to cover. Uh, welcome to church and all of that. But let's go. Yes? Amen. Genesis 18, verse 1. The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mom Ray. One day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. We know something about heat in Oklahoma. Amen. <laughs> hottest part of the day. When he saw, or I'm sorry, he looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. So just a couple tiny things before we get on with the rest of the story. First off, the Lord. The Lord. So that's all caps, L-O-R-D. We've talked about that before. When you see it in all caps in your Old Testament, that is what's behind it is the Hebrew Yahweh, the divine name. This isn't a generic God. This is, this is personal God. This is the God of the universe, the one true God, Yahweh. And so the, it starts right at the beginning of the story. This is Yahweh coming. Yahweh is coming and Abraham sees three men. Now, who are the three men? It's Yahweh. But who are the three men? So maybe it's Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe they're all there. I don't know. It's Yahweh. We call this a theophany. We call it a Christophany. It's, it's when Jesus Christ appeared before Bethlehem. Before, before the manger, before the nativity, before all of that, he was still showing up throughout the Old Testament. This is him. This is him. It's maybe the rest of the Trinity. It's him. Maybe a couple angels. We're not sure. But Abraham bows low to them. When the food was ready, now I skipped ahead to verse 8 because they were doing some food preparation stuff, but my favorite part is when the food is ready, amen? <laughs> so I jump right to verse 8. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and roasted meat, and he served it to the men, and as they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you, Abraham, about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. So she's inside the tent. They can't see her, but she's listening in because you can listen through tent material. Amen? So that's, that's, that all makes sense to us. Now, just a tiny bit of background. Up to this point in the Old Testament, God had been promising to Abraham and to Sarah that they would have a child, specifically a son, and that a nation would come from him. And he keeps repeating the promise to them. And this is a really big deal because Abraham's the father of the faith and he's called to believe. God keeps repeating the promise. <clears throat> but here's the problem. They keep getting older. And the older they get, the harder the promise is to believe because we're about to we're about to walk out of the scientific possibility that we can even have a child, God. It's just not going well. And so God comes back to repeat the promise and build their faith. Verse 11, Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure? And the Hebrew there is sexual pleasure just to make you uncomfortable this morning. How could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? So um, the, the, the Hebrew is very, very clear. She is past menopause here. She cannot, scientifically speaking, have children. And she's like, there's just no way this is going to happen. And so she laughs to herself silently. So I, I don't want to like bash Sarah too much here. She is being very respectful. She's being very proper. Like she thinks this is all funny, but she's there silently in the tent. She's not coming out like mocking them. What are you thinking? But what doesn't she have? She doesn't have faith Amen. that it can happen. So she laughs silently. She's not believing. Verse 11, then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, yeah, you laughed. 
lot going on in this passage. So I'm going to break this down a couple phrases at a time because I want you to see all the richness that's there. So number one, God says, why did, they, why did Sarah laugh? She thought she was laughing silently. Imagine her surprise when all of a sudden outside, God says, why did she just laugh? Whoa. That's, that's a hard moment, yes? <laughs> there are some things that we do because we don't think anybody can see us. Wrong. God sees everything. God hears everything, even your thoughts, even your silent motives. God not only sees it, but he reacts to it. Man, she's found out. She's in the presence of God. Sometimes that's a rattling thing, yes? Why did she laugh? God heard her. Number two, he says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Come on, like he sees right to the issue here is faith. Is anything too hard for God? Are, are you saying God can't do this? That, that word hard there, um, that's another fun Hebrew word I just want to give to you. It's, it's pele, pele is that Hebrew word. That word hard there, it, the literal meaning is wonderful. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is anything outside of the boundaries of what the marvelous things that God can do? Is it too marvelous for him to do? There's a, there's a verse, some of you guys know around um, Christmas time, we read this one. It's Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name will be called Wonderful. Jesus, one of Jesus' names will be that he will be called Wonderful. That's Pella. He is marvelous. He is the marvelous one. Amen. He is the wonderful one. And so, so, so God is right here saying, he's like, I know it's not scientifically possible, but is anything really impossible for God? No way. Sarah will have a baby at her old age. Number three, he, he says, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a baby I love the fact that he reinforces the promise and he says he's going to do it. Now, why is that surprising? Because here's the thing. Some of you guys were raised that God might say he's going to do a thing, but then what you get is you get the faith test. And you're supposed to believe. And if you believe, then God will do the thing. But if you don't believe and you don't have faith, then God won't do the thing. Amen. And you should not expect the thing if you don't show up with the faith and pass the faith test. Well, here's what's weird. She just failed the faith test. And God's like, I'm still going to do it. Oh, that's odd. Wait a second. So if God makes a promise, God will do it regardless of what you do. Amen. So let the word of God teach you how this really works and what his personality is really like. When God decides to do it, he will do it. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Number four, she says, I didn't laugh. <laughs> you lied. <laughs> but we get it, don't we? You lied. Why did she lie? Because she's human. Why did she lie, though? Because she's afraid. She's afraid. Yes, what is she afraid of? She's afraid she, she just may have failed the faith test. She's afraid that God may have hurt her, and now she's not going to get what she needs. That God may have hurt her, and, and now she's, she's going to get condemned, and she's going to be declared for all of human history, the woman who did not have faith. So what did she say? She said, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. And I love it. He doesn't argue with her. God doesn't argue with her. He doesn't like try to convince her. He doesn't, he doesn't yell. Like none of that stuff that we often do happens. He just says, yes, you did. I, I knew a pastor and he, he looked at this passage and this was big for him in his parenting because one of the two non-negotiables in their family while they were raising their kids was no disrespect and no lying because if we don't have the truth in our family, what do we have? 
And he looked at this passage and said, if ever my kids come and they lie, all I do is speak the truth back. Yes, you did. It's a good strategy. I, when I was a kid, I, my best friend growing up, his name was Brian Robin, and we lived within a block of each other, went to the same school, you know, summertime, like hanging out at each other's houses all the time and, and just close, close friends. And um, gosh, we were probably like seven or eight. And I remember just being in his house and we're playing video games. It was Atari in those days. Um, playing video games. And, and uh, anyway, he has this conversation with his mom and he just lies to her. And the lie didn't even matter, right? Like she's just asking him something. He just lies. And I was with him all day. I knew it was a lie. I don't even remember what happened, but he just lied. And I was just like, you know, I was like this church kid. I'm like, I didn't even know you could do that. You know, like he just lied. And I'm like asking him about it. He's like, oh, no, no. it's like, it's, it's not as hard as it looks. Here's what you do is, is you, you lie. And he's like, and then when they question you about it, you just push the lie. And you never give up on the lie. And no matter how much they confront you, no matter how much they fight you, you just keep saying the lie. He would win through stubbornness. I thought he was amazing. <laughs> I just, I saw him do it. But it's like, but what was really going on in their relationship? What he didn't realize is he was destroying the very foundation of the mother-son relationship. Because how could there be trust? And if there couldn't be trust, how could there ever be intimacy and real vulnerability and real love? Well, there couldn't be. He was, he was killing it. Two statistics on lying. The first one, a survey was done of 2,000 people, and they admitted out of those 2,000 people that they, the average admittance was that they lie four times per day. And then when they were asked how often other people lie to them, they said six times per day. Well, that doesn't match, does it? It's very interesting. Then another study was done. Uh, this is a 2002 study conducted by the University of Massachusetts, and they studied um, adult conversations, specifically people over 18, and they said they were able to track that within 10 minutes of 60% of the conversations, a lie was told within the first 10 minutes. 60% of the conversations, a lie was told within the first 10 minutes. And then they had a further statistic that said, and 85% of all the lying that they studied by adults in the conversations were told by parents. Oh. <laughs> Does this dress look cute, mommy? Was I on key in the play, mommy? Or daddy? Oh, no. Today's about lying. The big lies and the small lies. Can we relate to this? This is just first service. They're the liars. You guys are all good. <laughs> we can relate to this, right? <laughs> lying is this really big topic. The, the, the sneaky part about lying as a topic, though, is, is it feels so easy. Like, we all know this, right? We, we don't struggle with this, or do we? Or do we all struggle with this? And have we all just kind of gotten used to it, like a lot of things in our culture, we've just, we've just kind of embraced it. Um, this series is called Lasting Words. Lasting words. Pastor Ricky started this last week. And the concept with lasting words is the idea that every word that you say, whether it's good or bad, it lasts. It has a shelf life, like a Twinkie. It goes on and on and on and on. Some of you are here and you're dealing with words that got said to you decades ago. And they still hang over you. They still cause you pain. And some of it's the words that got said in the minivan on the way here to church this morning. Words, words not only hurt and have a great impact, but they have a lasting impact, lasting words. And, and lying is a part of that picture, the lies that we tell, the lies that have been told to us. So here's some truth about lies. Proverbs 12, 22, God hates lies. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. Now, just really briefly, this is just God's perspective on lying. And that word, that, that phrase, he detests, the Hebrew is, it's an abomination to him. Some of you grew up and people told you certain things were abominations. Lying is an abomination to God. 
It's that big of a deal. Why is it such a big word? Because he knows lies matter. He knows lies hurt us and hurt our families. Next, lies have a daddy. This is John 8, 44. For you are children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus in this little moment, he's doing, a, he's doing kind of a, an overview of what Satan is like. Now, Satan is not, uh, he's not a cartoon. Satan is not a symbol. Satan is a spiritual being. And the Bible talks about him quite a bit, actually. He's real. He has a character. And what Jesus is saying here is, when you operate in this kind of character, you're associating yourselves with him, and you're showing that you are a chip off the old block. You're walking in your daddy's footsteps because he cannot even speak the truth. He is the father of lies. So when we speak lies, we're right in step. Jesus, however, is on the side of truth. John 18, 37. He says, in fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now, this is a conversation, this verse right here, it's a conversation he was having with Pontius Pilate. It's right before he went to the cross and Pilate sends him there and condemns him. But Pilate's interviewing Jesus before the cross and asking Jesus what he's about and who he is. Jesus summarizes a big part of why he came. He says, this world is a place full of lies and I've come to bring truth. I've come to speak truth. And then he says, and by the way, there's two sides. There's people who are on the side of truth, people who are on the side of lies. What side are you on? Jesus is on the side of truth. We're picking sides, jeez. Yeah. He kind of makes it into a big deal, yes? Why? Because Jesus is the truth. You know, I don't have a slide for this, but John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus doesn't say, I have some way, I have some truth, I have some life. He says, no, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Well, what's that phrasing for? Well, you're trying to say, he's trying to say that he's the source of truth. Amen. He's where it comes from. You want to find truth? It's in Jesus. It all flows out of him. So like mathematics, the order of the universe, the seasons, DNA, physics, everything that orders this universe and is a truth that we can stand on so that we can make machines that stand on that truth. Guess where it all comes from? It comes from him. God is a God of order. God is a God of truth, of black and white. That's God. Our philosophers talk about gray, and I get it. But scientists, they want black and white. So do your doctors, by the way. You don't want to hear gray from your doctor, amen? amen? I want to hear yes or no. That's what I want to hear from that person. God is yes or no. God is the source of all truth, and he's the source of beauty and all peace and all joy and all goodness and all justice and all righteousness in the world. It all flows from God. God also, his nature is to only ever speak the truth. God will never lie. So this is Hebrews 6, 17 says that it is impossible for God to lie. Why is it impossible for him to lie? Because he is the truth. There you go. Come on. He is the truth. So he can't, I'm just worshiping God now. Are you okay? Because he can only ever speak what's true. And many of us have never even faced a being like that. Like, what is that even like? You'll only ever speak the truth to me. That means you're willing to face the consequences of the truth no matter what they are. Because let's be real. Most of us are like Sarah. We get to a place of fear. And we speak a lie to get away from that fear. We speak a lie because we don't trust that God will get us through the truth. 
We're going to be embarrassed. We're going to hurt somebody. We're going to hurt ourselves. We're not going to get the promotion. We'll lose our reputation. This relationship, this person might leave me if I tell them what actually happened. All those things come to us. And in order to, in order to avoid those consequences, we tell the lie because we trust the lie and we don't trust God to get us through. Amen. That's how it works. God will always face the consequences of the truth. There's a courage in God, he will never shrink back. He will never self-protect. He will always tell you what's true. God will never deceive you in cruelty. You've known people who, who they deceived you because they found it to be fun, to make you small and themselves bigger. God will never do that to you. God has no interest in propaganda. You know, like politicians speak, right? And then in the after show, somebody comes up with a fact checker and they're like, oh, only 20% of what they said was a lie. And you're like, well, that's, that's not so bad in our culture, you know? <laughs> and why are they lying to you? Because they're afraid of what the truth will do. And they're trying to coerce you. They're trying to influence you. They're trying to get your vote. They're trying... Yes, sir. God, won't, God won't do that. God will just only ever tell you the truth because he is the truth, which means he doesn't need a fact checker. Can you, somebody needs to write a worship song. God doesn't need a fact checker. And he's honest, almost brutally so. Also, there's something about God. He's not ashamed of who he is. Many of us lie because we're ashamed of who we are. And I can't let you see the real me. Because if I let you see the real me, you would walk away, and that's my deepest fear. So I have to tell the lie. Can you imagine a God who's so secure in who he is, not ashamed at all of who he is, that he can only tell the truth ever about who he is? And can you imagine somebody who is that emotionally whole as a being? He's the one we're worshiping. And is it just possible that as we worship the, the, the only person in the universe who is actually emotionally whole, that we might start to become like him the more that we worship him? And maybe a day will come when I'm not ashamed of who I am. Hallelujah. He doesn't want shallow relationships because he knows deep intimacy is possible for us if we can be truthful. Which side are you on? Who do you belong to? Because it'll change your life. So let's talk about the consequences of our lies. We, we got to say some bad news before we get to the good news. So you got to hang in there with me, okay? Because many of us are like, it's, it's, it's about the little white lies that I told in Sunday school and I shouldn't have done it. And it, it you know, somebody checked a box and, and, and it wasn't moral and, and all this kind of stuff. It's kind of naughtiness, right? Like, like that's what we put. We put lying into that category, but it's not. Lying is this really big thing that's killing us. And we got to talk about it. We got we to go into what it's the, the poison that it is so that we want to get free of it. So the first way that lying is killing you is through broken trust in your friendships. This first section is your friendships. The second section is what it's doing to you personally. It's breaking your trust. I had, I've got a couple of members of my extended family who make things up sometimes. You know, sometimes you go to the family reunion and people start telling the old family stories, the old family legends. And sometimes when they're spinning the tails around the potluck, sometimes new things start to come in. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they've got me doing something and saying something that's very surprising, very surprising to me because I don't even think I was there. And you're like, you're okay with really just spinning a, a whole new fiction. And if you've done that, how many of the other things that we tell around the potluck are also fictions? Yeah. Because as soon as you've grown comfortable with that, how do I really trust that what you give me is the truth, because trust breaks. And that's, that's just one example, but you know, that's all over, right? Like the reason I was late is because the car broke down on the way. Is that true, or did you just sleep through the alarm clock? 
That, that, that sounds innocuous, but you realize that the more you tell stuff like that, the more I don't trust that, you know. And all of a sudden you're saying, the reason I'm home so late is because I had to work late. And I'm wondering, did you really? Or did you stop somewhere else? And now it gets real. And now some of the li- those lies really start to matter and really start to make us feel really shaky. It breaks trust. Shallow friendships. When you can't trust each other, when you can't go deep, you can't, you can't share intimate things about yourself. One of the beautiful things in human relationships when love is actually working is that you share something deep about yourself and then I share something back. But that intimacy comes with trust. I, I've got to trust that you're going to do well with the secret that I told you. I've got to trust that when you spoke something back, you were also making a, an authentic relational step toward me by sharing something real about yourself, not making something up. Shallow friendships. Next is double life kind of misery. This is, this is when you tell really big lies, right? Like you, you lie a lot and, and you got some really, you know, big dog lies in your life. And, and, and because they're there, you've got to keep track of who's believing what thing. And you've got to, you've got to tell some sub lies to support the big lie. Amen. Right? And sometimes you lose track and it's an exhausting process and And the more of those little lies that you tell to support the big lies, it becomes a whole other double life, a whole other second you that's out there in front of these people. But the real you is what's on the inside, right? So like like what they know, what they see, what they're trying to love is not the real thing that's on the inside of you. And so guess what? You're the loneliest person imaginable because people don't know you. It's exhausting, crushes us. We curse the next generation. If you've brought this life pattern of deception instead of honesty into your family, into your marriage, guess who's watching? The next generation, they're always watching. And and because I don't want to be embarrassed or I don't want you to be embarrassed or because I don't want to face this consequence, I don't want you to face that consequence. All those things, if if, if my go-to is a lie, my kids will see it and they'll walk in it. Don't do that to them. Let's get into the personal stuff. There's an emotional prison. Are we doing okay? this This is a lot of dark, okay? I'll move through the second section pretty quick, but it's a prison. That's what you face yourself, is it's a prison. Every every lie that you tell, what it does, especially on the repeat lies, it increases your fear and anxiety. It it, it increases your fear and anxiety because someday you know you are going to get found out. It's only a matter of time. And you just keep stirring that, and the ground feels more and more shaky underneath your feet. Someday they'll find out. Someday they'll know. Someday they'll know how long you've been trapped and how long you haven't been truthful and honest with them, and everything will change. And because that pressure of that that future, when it all comes crashing down, because the pressure of that is so big, you hold on to it so much more, and you're the one that's in a prison. Does that make sense? And and it's a self-made prison. You've built it around yourself. Every lie is a prison that you build around yourself. It's it's weird. It's like you tell the lie in order to get free from a fear, but you've built a prison around you. We're going to dive into that a little bit more later. Next, you doubt God. Because a lie is fear and it's not faith. There There are some truths that you need to tell And if you told them, it'd be this massive leap of faith for you that I'll I'll get through to the other side. And that leap of faith, it's not in you and it's not in the other person to look the other way at your sin. Your faith is in God. You're going to have faith in God when you go to tell the truth that he's going to get you through, even if it's awful, even if the reaction is awful, which it might be. 
But your faith is in God that God will bring good out of the bad because that's what God does. He brings good out of the bad. But it, it might be a rough time. But you're doubting God by staying there. You're lying to fix things and you're staying there. Trust God. Next is self-hatred. When you know that you're lying and you're doing it a lot, you know that you don't have integrity and you don't like yourself. You don't respect yourself because you, we're all born with it. We're all bar, born with this innate sense that I should be just as true on the outside as I am on the inside. They should match. Like we know that. And when you're not that way, you don't like you. You end up hating you. Then you lose reality. Loss of reality is the next one. The fictions that you create, that you spin, kind of get lost and confused. And then finally, you stop growing as a person. Arrested growth. You stop growing spiritually and emotionally and relationally with other people because by being a person who always tries to run out the escape hatch of lying when things get hard, you don't, you don't bring the opportunity for growth to yourself. It's just not what God wants for you. Okay, that's all the bad. You made it. The hard part about saying all of that truth, as hard as it is, is that you would start to believe the lie that you're the only liar in the room. So look around. You're in good company. Because we all are. We don't have some special Sunday school, ultra-churched people who never lie, and then there's just you. That's not, it's not this church. You're all liars. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, it's just a matter of where are you lying. So we got to say that because at the foot of the cross, it's level. We're all on the same level. And when we're talking about the line, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to go after those categories in your life where you're not being truthful because you've all got them. John 8, 31, truth sets you free. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus knew that when he came, he came into a world of lies and he was the first person to truly bring the truth. And he wanted everything to be truth because he knew the truth leads you to freedom. Why? Because the lie put you in a prison. And it's the truth that makes you free. So at my last church, we had a ministry called Celebrate Recovery. There's one here uh, locally at Cameron Baptist. It's beautiful ministry, Celebrate Recovery, people getting free from their addictions. And, and, and we would have people, they, they, they'd share their testimony and their story, which is the most precious thing you have, by the way. They'd share their testimony and their story at Celebrate Recovery. And then sometimes we'd bring them into Sunday mornings and they would share it up front. And they would sit there. I mean, people like free of alcoholism, they're like, here's all that I did for decades and and here's all the people that got hurt and all the destruction and all. The, and it's like, why would you tell all that negative, bad stuff? Because that's the stuff that got you to rock bottom. And that's the stuff that other people, when they hear it, they say, me too. I've done something like that. And if God could save him, maybe God could save me. And all of a sudden, all around the room, faith is building in the room. And people are worshiping the one true God who's actually good instead of worshiping people. Do you see how that starts to change? It starts to shift around because that person is confessing. They're getting it out there. And the truth starts to set that person free. Well, how does that work? Because every time that person tells the story, they get a little more free because they see purpose in their story. And the shame that they used to walk in where they lied and they kept it secret as a double life, they're doing the exact opposite. That's them walking out of the prison. It's the way you come out of your prison is to confess Amen. and tell your story. Linda and I have told this before, but we, we had gone through this period in our marriage where we fell out of love with each other, didn't like each other very much. And... I remember the very first time that we told that story in detail in a premarital class 
trying to help some other people. And I checked with her first, by the way. Don't tell your spouse's truth without their permission. That's a, that's, that one's free. Don't ever do that. I remember telling this story. We, I remember the first time we were so nervous. The first time we did it, we went into this group and we told these other couples. And all of a sudden, people were like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't know you could fall out of love and then fall back into love again. I thought when you fell out of love, you just got divorced. Isn't that what people do? It's like, no, you can fall back into love again. That's a whole other sermon by itself, but the story built hope. And then we walked out of there that night and it was like, there was purpose in everything that we went through. Thank God. Amen. And then we started to get free of it. We weren't as embarrassed anymore. And every single time we ever told the story, we got less and less embarrassed. We saw more and more ministry come out of our pain. And all of a sudden we're looking back and we're like, that's not so shameful anymore. God's using our sin. Even our sin. God's using it. And we're walking out of the prison. Do you see it? Like the, there was a, there was a, I remember the, there was a Sunday that I first told a congregation of people that I had had a pornography addiction in my past that God had had to lead me out of. Still in process, still recovering. But that was a hard thing to share for the first time. There were people making eye contact with me that day in the congregation, and I could see it. It's like, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm going to trust you anymore. You're supposed to be this person on this pedestal up here, and I'm not... Like, I don't know what to, and they were struggling. I could see it in their eyes, but other people were like, if God could set him free and still love him and forgive him and still use him in ministry in the kingdom of God, maybe he can use me. Amen. Worth it. And getting free. It's level at the foot of the cross, folks. Ephesians 4, 24 Truth makes your friendships whole. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Put off your falsehood. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are of all parts of the same body. Amen. Now that last phrase there should strike you as weird. What, why, why do we need to tell truth? Because we're all part of the same body. What he's speaking to there is community. What he's saying is, if in your family, you're not speaking the truth to each other, you're not whole. You want to have a good community? Your church, your family, your city, your school, you need truth there. Confessing truth heals you, James 5, 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that, that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So here he's saying the way out of your prison is to confess your truth. But notice this. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. Confessing. Confessing. That's a, it's a weird thing because often in the New Testament, when you confess sins, you confess it directly to Jesus. Did you know that? You confess it to Jesus because Jesus is the one who died on the cross for you and he hears you. You don't have to go through a pastor or a priest or anybody else to confess your sin and to get free of it. You just confess it straight to God. Like that's the way that it's supposed to work. But here in James, he gives us a little, slightly different twist. He's like, but there is a moment where you can confess to other people. And he doesn't mean a priest in a booth somewhere. He means any of your brothers and sisters in Christ, you can confess to them. And when you confess to them, you get healed. So... Confessing to Jesus, you get forgiven, which has got healing to it. But there's a community confession. He says, when you, when you all of a sudden you start telling other people what the truth is about what you've done, there's a healing that comes from that because as long as you've got it in a dark corner, it gets worse. As long as you've got it in a dark corner and no one else knows about it, everything is bad. Yes. Confess it to some other people. And I don't mean go blasting it to everybody. Don't overshare and don't share with people who cannot be trusted because some people will look at you and say, man, glad you told me that, but you're a really bad person and I'm not going to be your friend anymore. I mean, there, there are people who can't handle your confession. But when you've got a brother or sister in Christ who understands grace and they can handle your confession, telling them that leads to your healing. It's a massive thing. So we're almost done. Come out of your prison. Come out. You come out of your prison by confessing. 
Where you've lied, you've got to start telling the truth. The people that you have lied to, you've got to start telling the truth to them. You're like, I can't. Yes, you can. It's faith. Do you see how this is a leap of faith? This is super hard. Come out. You're the one in a prison. Come out. When I say that, most of us in the room are hearing a counterpoint from our spiritual enemy. What he is saying to you is that it's too late. He is saying to you right now, you can't come out because it's too late. You can't come out because you've already screwed it up. You can't come out because if they find out, they'll never love you again. You can't come out. It's too late. Damage done. Come out. He's wrong. Come out. Last verse. Genesis 21, 2 through 3. Sarah became pregnant. I'm taking you back to Abraham and Sarah. We were in Genesis 18 before. Now we're in 21. Remember, God had told her, I'm going to come back next year at this time and Sarah will have a son. Do you remember that? He promised her, even though she didn't pass the faith test, even though she lied, he still promised it was going to happen. So what you see right here is that it happened. Sarah became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. And this happened at just the time that God had said that it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Isaac. So here's the twist ending. Guess what Isaac means in Hebrew? It means laughter. It means laughter. What does that tell you? Do they remember the moment a year ago? Heck yeah, they do. Are they still in bondage about it? And in shame about it? about what she had done, still embarrassed, still can't tell anybody, any of that? No. Somehow they got to this place where they're able to talk about it. <laughs> the goofballs that we were. And we didn't believe God. And we didn't believe God so much, we laughed at God. We laughed at God. And then when we laughed at God, God called us out on it, and then we lied to God about laughing at him. And, and somehow they're so in this, this place of like moving past their lie and being in the truth. They're so out of their prison. Get the book of baby names out. We're going to call him laughter. And we're never going to forget that moment. Why? You're like, but that wasn't your good moment. I know, but it was his good moment. Because that's what you start to do. You start to laugh at dumb you. And you start to praise big him. That's coming out. Let's call him laughter. And every single time he asks us, why did you name me laughter? Let's tell you the story. And we're going to get more and more and more free. Because the truth does that. Even if you've been trapped in lies your whole life, truth can start. He's going to ask us. And then the grandkids are going to ask us. And then this is going to get written in the Bible. And everybody for thousands of years are going to read about our laugh. Name the child laughter. You only do that if you're free. Amen? Don't you guys stand. You only do it if you're free. Hmm. Lord, you're so good to us. Thank you for being the truth itself. Thank you, God, for showing us a different way. God, this world has shown us one way. Our parents showed us one way. Our grandparents showed us one way. And God, most of them were wrong. But Jesus, you've come with a new way. 
courageous, healing truth. God, I speak against all the prisons that are in this room. And God, I ask for a blessing of courage over everyone. Lord, I pray that you would heal families, heal marriages. Bring the truth in. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name.